Hi everyone, how's it going? So in this video, we're finally going to start talking about the Garch model. So I made the video on the Arch model a long time ago, and the most frequent comment on that video was, please make a video on the Garch model. It's taken me a little while, but we're finally here. And as long as it's taken between making the Arch model video and this one, um, the truth is the Garch model is not that much more complicated than the Arch model. But that said, I would understand the Arch model first. So if you haven't seen the Arch model video, please go ahead and watch that video and understand the Arch model. If you really don't want to watch it, I will explain the basic, basic idea of the Arch model here, but it would really help if you had a more in-depth understanding. So how we're going to understand the Garch model to make it most easy on us is going to be starting from the relationship between the AR11 model and the ARMA11 model. Because that's going to be a very similar logical jump to going from the ARCH11 model to the GARCH11 model. And that'll make our lives a lot easier. So let's start talking again at the AR1 model. The AR1 model, the logical idea behind it, even without talking about the math, is saying that if I want to predict the time series on some given day, I can use the time series lagged one day prior. So basically, I can predict where I'm going to be tomorrow based on where I am today. That is the basic idea of the AR1 model. And in an equation, we basically say that the value of the time series on any given day is some coefficient times the value of the time series prior one day. And we add, of course, this epsilon sub t, which is called a random error or sometimes a random innovation. In a causal diagram, which is in this red box here, we say that if I knew two quantities, if I knew those two quantities for sure, I could tell you for sure what the value of the time series will be on any given day. Those two quantities are, first, the value of the time series on the previous day, and second, the random error or innovation on the current day. Of course, the issue in time series modeling is we don't usually know the random error or innovation on a given day. That's the difficulty. But if we knew that error innovation, and if we knew the value of the time series on the previous day, I could tell you with full certainty what the value of the time series would be today. Keep that in mind. Now let's jump to the ARMA11 model. Now remember, ARMA11 is a combination of the AR1 model and the MA1 model. So if we look at the equation, it says that uh, the value of a time series is equal to some coefficient times the value of the time series one day prior, same thing as the AR1. The new part is the MA1, which is we also add some coefficient times the random error or innovation from the previous day. And then we have to add the same thing, which is the random error from today. So looking at the causal diagram for the ARMA11 model, it's just one extra thing in there, which is the random error or innovation from the previous day. So what I say is, if I knew three things, if I knew the value of the time series yesterday, the value of the innovation from yesterday, and the value of the innovation from today, I could tell you with full certainty what the time series would be today. So that's the logical jump from AR to ARMA. Now let's go ahead and look at the ARCH1 model. The ARCH1 model, remember, is basically a model that takes into account the um, volatility or how, uh, how far away the time series is jumping. And it takes that information into account to help predict what the next uh, value will be of the time series. The basic idea of the ARCH1 model, or the ARCH model in general, is saying, if I'm jumping a lot today, like if my time series is very volatile today, it's probably going to be also pretty volatile tomorrow. If it's not very volatile today, it's very steady, then it'll probably be very steady tomorrow as well. That's the basic idea of the ARCH1 model. So the ARCH1 model is saying that the value of a time series is given by epsilon sub t, which remember is white noise, times the square root of some constant plus another constant times the value of the time series yesterday squared. And as we saw in the ARCH video, this guy, as complicated as it looks, can be shown to be the standard deviation of the time series or the volatility of the time series on the given day, which is why we're allowed to write AT, the value of the time series, as a function of the white noise and white noise multiplied by the volatility of the time series today. So if I draw that in a causal diagram, I basically say that the value of the time series today is affected by the random error today and the volatility today. And since the volatility today is a function of the time series yesterday, I have another little causal piece right here which says volatility today is affected by the value of the time series yesterday. So go ahead and pause or rewind and convince yourself of this equation and this causal diagram keeping in mind the logical idea behind both of them. Now that means, uh, if I trace back in this diagram, I can, I can say that uh, the time series today is a function of the innovation today and the time series yesterday, because I'm just tracing back to all the leaves of the causal diagram. So basically, it's affected by these two things. 
which are the same two things of the uh, AR1 model. It's just that we're putting these things together in a slightly different way. Now, here's a problem with the ARCH1 model, because why would we even need a GARCH model, whatever that means, um, if there wasn't some deficiency in the um, ARCH1 model? In the same way that why would we need an ARMA model if there wasn't something wrong with the AR model? So the thing, the issue with the ARCH model is that it can be something called bursty. So this is a term that time series people like to use. Um, bursty just means that um, if I'm modeling a ARCH1 process, it'll be kind of constant and then it'll jump and then it'll kind of just go back to the uh, regular state it was at. It'll jump again, it'll go back to the regular state it was at. So it has these kind of like bursts of volatility rather than persistent volatility, which means if I'm trying to model something that has more persistent volatility, let's say that like, um, an example we used before was like ice cream sales. Let's say you're an ice cream salesman and you find that usually your returns are something like this, but um, some, once in a while they'll jump to a high value and kind of stay there for a couple days and then they'll go back to normal. Sometimes they'll jump to a really low value and kind of stay there for a couple days or maybe a couple weeks and then they'll go back to normal. Arch by itself isn't super great at dealing with that because it's good at modeling these bursts. So we need something more. We need something better. That's where Garch comes in. So the GARCH11 model looks like this, and I have to fill in one piece, but the part I've written so far looks exactly like the ARCH1 model. Here's the new part, plus some other constant times the volatility of the time series yesterday squared. So this is fundamentally different from what we were doing before, because before we were taking into account the volatility today, and we're still doing that here, because this piece is still sigma sub t, okay? So the equation still holds. But now if we look at the causal diagram, we see that the value of the time series today is affected by this uh, white noise, of course. It's affected by uh, sigma sub t, which is here. But sigma sub t is made up of two different components now. It's affected by two different things. Because if we look at this guy, this square root, which is sigma sub t, we see that it's affected by the value of the time series yesterday, but also the volatility yesterday. So I'm going to fill in that. So we see that the basically the story in this part of the causal diagram is that your volatility today is affected by the value of your time series yesterday, but also your volatility yesterday, which logically makes sense, right? Because it's saying that if your time series was really high yesterday and it was also really volatile yesterday, it's probably going to be really volatile today. So that's why this makes sense logically. Now, if I do the same thing here, if I look at all the leaves of the causal diagram, then I can say that my time series today is a function of the random error innovation today, the time series yesterday, which is what I had before, but also the volatility yesterday. And the fact that I now include the volatility from yesterday is going to make my resulting time series a lot less bursty. And so it'll look more like this, which means that when it kind of jumps, it sort of stays there for a while before returning to normal. When it jumps in the negative direction, it sort of stays there for a while before returning to normal. And to kind of get an intuition for why that is based on the equations, um, we are not only taking into account the value of the time series yesterday, we're also taking into account the volatility yesterday. So if it was really, uh, if it went far away from its average yesterday, then we take that into account into the volatility today so that it's still going to remain volatile today and maybe the next day and the next week until eventually it goes back to its average near its mean and then maybe it goes in the negative direction and it kind of stays there for a while. So because we take into account the volatility or the standard deviation from previous time periods, we are able to kind of propagate this volatility over time rather than just getting rid of it after one or two time periods as in the ARCH1 model. The last two things I want to talk about are uh, where do these coefficients come from? So this is called the ARCH11 model because we take into account one uh, time period from yesterday for the time series itself and the volatility. So if I had an ARCH22 model, it would be taking into account a t minus 1 and a t minus 2, and then also sigma t minus 1 and sigma t minus 2. So basically just taking more previous time periods into account. I think you're comfortable with that idea. And the last thing I want to talk about is, of course, what does GARCH actually stand for? I didn't want to lead with that because I think most time series models are named not very helpfully. But remember, ARCH stands for autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity. So autoregressive because we're taking into account previous volatility and conditional heteroscedasticity because we are dealing with volatility. GARCH, uh, the last four letters are the same. 
G just stands for generalized. So basically it's just saying that we're not only taking into account the value of the time series at pre previous time periods, we're also taking into account values of the volatility at previous time periods. So that's what the generalized means, although by itself it's not very helpful in explaining anything. Um, so that is your Garch model. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. Thanks for watching.